Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by Internex, Grid Modernization Behind the Utility Curtain. I'm Aaron Steiner, and I'll be the one moderating today's session. Um, a couple of things before we get going. Um, I wanted to let you know we're going to have two presentations and then a moderated Q&A session. Um, for those of you who didn't get my email earlier today, there's a question uh, pane in your control panel tool. You can type those in at any time, um, and we'll moderate those at the end of the presentation. Um, you also have the opportunity, um, once we open the Q&A, to use the raise your hand tool, um, which looks kind of like a hand, and then and we'll let you ask your own question, um, prefer to be questions. Um, we're making a recording of this webinar. If that makes you uncomfortable, um, this is your opportunity to go ahead and log off um, if you don't want to be heard. Um, both the slides and the recording of this webinar are going to be published on our website um, within a day or two. I wanted to point out also, though, you have a handouts um, pane in your control panel, and today's slides and actually the slides from the previous session are both available there in PDF form. Um, and I'd encourage you to go ahead and download those at your earliest convenience. It may help you um, read ahead or see some questions or uh, may help you think of questions or the like. I'm going to go ahead and do the introductions and then turn it over to our presenters. Um, today we have folks from Burlington Electric Department in Burlington, Vermont, Darren Springer, Katie Dory, and Kathy Chamberlain. Darren's the Chief Operating Officer and Manager of Strategy Innovation, and he's had several prominent public service positions, including the roles as Chief of Staff to the Vermont Governor, as the Deputy Commissioner at the Vermont Public Service Department, and as a Senior Policy Advisor and Chief Counsel to U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders, and as a Program Director for Energy and Transportation at the National Governors Association. Darren has a JD and a Master of Studies in Environmental Law from Vermont Law School, and has been admitted to the Vermont, Virginia, and Florida Bar. Kathy Chamberlain is the Administrator of Engineering Utility Services, and has been with Burlington Electric for over 41 years. Amongst her many duties, she is responsible for work order and purchase order management, power outage scheduling, and addressing customer operations concerns. She is also an award-winning professional photographer and at a golf, golf and bowling, bowling tournament organizer and United Way representative for all of the City of Burlington offices. Katie Dory, customer care representative, has been a member of the team at BED for nearly two and a half years. Prior to that position, she worked as a case manager for a local nonprofit. She has a BA in psychology and a BA in history from the University of Vermont and is currently pursuing an MBA at Champlain College. Neil Placer, Director of Utility Consulting at Internex, has 20 years of work experience and brings a unique cross-cutting industry perspective, having worked for major corporations in both the solar energy and electric utility sectors. Neil's overarching focus is to combine his broad engineering experience and strategic technical and communications capabilities to simplify complex challenges into holistic, no regret solutions for Internex clients. Now, representing Hawaiian Electric Companies, we have Rodney Chong, the Manager of Grid Modernization. Rodney is responsible for providing leadership and strategic direction on all matters related to the implementation of the Hawaiian Electric Company's Grid Modernization Strategy. This multi-year strategy outlines the company's plan to increase reliability, incorporate more renewable resources, and give customers more tools to manage their energy use. The plan focuses on near-term improvements that incorporate a wide range of technologies to enable greater private rooftop solar adoption, as well as grid-scale renewables, while also providing flexibility to accept future technological breakthroughs. In this role, Rodney works closely with project teams and interfaces with groups who are either a part of or matrix to operations and execution of the grid modernization plan. He also ensures seamless integration with the company's power supply improvement plan. Jeremy Londrigan is our engagement lead and also Internex's Vice President of Consulting Services. Jeremy assists our clients with strategic development, project planning, regulatory engagement, economic analysis, life cycle management, and technology assessment. Jeremy is an award-winning project management professional with over 15 years of experience and a master's degree in engineering management. Jeremy's recent projects with Internex have included assisting Hawaiian electric companies with their grid modernization strategy and integrated grid planning, estimating Southern California Edison grid modernization costs and benefits, and assisting Consolidated Edison with its grid modernization roadmap and implementation plan. All these grid mod projects include considerations for renewable generation 
and the distributed energy resource integration. Now, for context, um, some of you may not have been part of the, the June 20 um, webinar, and um, wherein we outlined that grid modernization is not really a destination or a single unified thing. It's a collection of attributes used to, the, to define the grid or divine, define this movement. In the same way that we define intelligent grid, modern grid, and smart grid, things you may have heard of over the last 15 years or so. I also presented um, an illustrative way you can lay out what's involved in a grid modernization project, whether it's strategy, how you define things, whether you go through your procurement, how you do your project management, and how you do your technology transfer, all with the ultimate goal of having greater resilience, improved reliability, enhanced security, additional affordability, superior flexibility, and increased sustainability. Those are the attributes that we're using to define grid modernization. So with that, I'll hand it over to Rodney. Rodney, you're, you're good to go. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, good morning, everyone. At least it's morning for me here in Hawaii. But um, yeah, as uh, Aaron mentioned, I'm the manager of grid modernization. I've been in this role for about eight months now. So uh, prior to this uh, getting started, and you know, Jeremy, who, who's uh, also on this call, um, was heavily involved uh, prior to that in development of the grid mod strategy. So the grid mod strategy was filed uh, in August of last year, the final version. And, um, you know, my role, uh, which started the ending part of last year, was to uh, kick off the implementation piece uh, here in the company. So one of the key things we got in February this year was, um, I'll call it an acceptance by the commission of the grid mod strategy and in order to move forward. So I'll cover a little bit about what we view as a grid mod strategy and, and what we're doing uh, at this point. Aaron, uh, if you can move to the next slide, please. So one of the first things I, I realized I needed to do um, when I first got involved in just talking to folks in the company um, was that even within the company, not a lot of people did not have a good uh, uh, an idea of what grid modernization was. And as Aaron kind of alluded to in previous slides, you know, depends on what utility you ask, and you know, they might have a different view of that. And so, um, after talking to uh, folks who were involved in the grid mod strategy, and and uh, you know, getting an understanding what is what is the scope of this program, um, one of the things I needed to focus on was internal engagement within the company, especially if I'm going to be able to successfully implement this. So, you know, there's a lot of folks in the company that's going to be involved in the implementation from the technical side of the company as well as the non-technical. And what I like to do is try and, uh, you know, engage them by using analogies with that they can relate to. So this is the slide that I found to be most uh, effective that I start with. And, you know, I, I, I kind of point out that, you know, the grid is like uh, our, an unsignalized intersection. Okay, I don't know where this picture came from. I found it on uh, through Google, but uh, you know, I gave this example. I said, you know, back 10 years ago, you know, uh, most grids were uh, operating and, and flowed in one direction, and much like an unsignalized in intersection, that was probably fine 10 years ago if traffic flowed in one direction. And as more cars added were added to the road, that's fine. But once you had uh, traffic flowing in multiple directions, it caused problems. You know, um, what was fine 10 years ago is not fine today, and if you keep adding more cars to the road, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause problems. Uh, much like our grid, uh, especially here in Hawaii, what we saw was an exponential growth, growth of rooftop PV. And, you know, there's many instances where you had uh, power flowing in, in uh, backwards, especially in the middle of the day when uh, nobody's home to use uh, energy. Yeah. Next slide, please, Aaron. So sticking with that analogy, um, what I point people to is how intersections have been modernized. Um, and you've probably seen this uh, where you live too, but you know, here in Hawaii over the years, um, intersections have been modernized. Of course, they always had traffic lights, but uh, you know, um, they've had a lot of sensors installed in the road, um, traffic cameras to uh, you know, clue people in if there's accidents or uh, heavy traffic. Uh, there's always 
the automation that is uh, continuously being improved such that uh, they know when there's a pedestrian crossing the road versus a car waiting, waiting to cross. And, you know, there's been an uh, increase or a growth in the traffic management center here in Hawaii that helps to manage um, the traffic situation throughout the island. So, you know, I point people to this and say, this is what we need to get to with our grid. You know, there's a lot of uh, uh, parts of the grid, the distribution and, and uh, secondary level where we have no visibility. We never had to in the past, but with the uh, incre exponential uh, increase of uh, distributed resources, we need that visibility. We need control. We need sensors. We need notifications that there's something wrong at that level of the grid and some level of automation. So this is where I try to make people realize that, uh, you know, this is what grid monetization is about, at least here at Hawaii Electric. So really it's a grid monetization is an infrastructure project. That's the way I keep uh, explaining it to folks. And it's a platform that's going to enable many programs in the future, enable further growth of distributed resources. Um, we've had exponential growth over the past 10 years. And uh, according to our plans, to get to 100%, we need to enable more growth. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, this uh, this is actually uh, covering the principles that's covered in the grid mod strategy. And, you know, what, what this kind of shows is that, you know, based on past uh, uh, dockets with the commission and, um, you know, there was, I guess, uh, an outcry from, from customers when, you know, certain circuits were getting oversaturated with PV and, you know, there was a backlog because there was issues that our folks uh, had concerns about. And, you know, there was a realization that, okay, you only can put so much PV on the grid unless you have visibility or, or some improvements to enable more penetration. And so, obviously, if you look at the picture on the left, you know, people within the company and, and we tried to explain it externally that, you know, the traditional grid was not really designed for two-way power flow. And, you know, if we're really going to get to 100% renewables, we need to move to a more uh, modern grid that, you know, is equipped to handle this. And so, um, it obviously limited the amount of programs that people wanted to adopt. And, you know, here in Hawaii, retail electricity is, is pretty high. And so, um, when um, the cost of oil really uh, skyrocketed, you know, largely due to the earthquake in Japan, um, it was a no-brainer for folks to put TV on their roofs. And, you know, they were able to get payback on their systems like in three years. So, um, you know, it was, it was a combination of those aspects that caused the exponential growth. And so what we try to say or show through, you know, this picture is that, you know, the grid that we've had for the past, you know, 100 years is not the grid we need to get to the future that we're, we're looking for. So it's going to have to enable two-way power flow, provide customer choice for all these creative programs that are coming up, but still maintain the reliability that, you know, we, is expected of us as a utility. So, you know, development of... Um, you know, the proper infrastructure is going to, you know, enable this while still maintaining the principles that is expected of us as an electric utility. Uh, next slide. So, you know, a lot of people wanted to see, say, you know, well, what is the components of it? Physically, I, I don't understand what it's going to look like. So, you know, we tried to um, use this picture to you know, provide some uh, idea of physically what they would see. So, you know, for um, folks uh, that were uh, involved in uh, past projects where we tried to deploy AMI, they understood the, the smart meter part of it. Um, but what they didn't understand was that there's other components outside of the house that will uh, make up the grid monetization program. And so, an example is uh, sensors that we've been putting on pad mount transformers the past few years. Um, we've also installed um, a few interruptors. 
uh, to provide sectionalizing. And we've, for a num number of years, been putting in uh, uh, FCIs, um, but the newer ones that we've been putting in actually have communication capability to help pinpoint outages and so forth. Um, over the years, past 20 years about, we've been um, providing or installing SCADA capability at uh, our distribution substations as well. Um, so about half of our distribution subs here in, on Oahu does have SCADA capability. Um, but we also point to that, hey, we need a communications infrastructure to bring all this information back to operation. And so we, we've experimented with this in the past. We tried to get approval for um, our smart grid project three years ago, and that tried to uh, uh, deploy um, a Silver Springs network uh, radio mesh. So some people were familiar with that, but we had to, you know, remind them that, uh, you know, a communications backbone was needed, and that was um, our, still our vision going forward was to install an RF mesh system to bring back a lot of the uh, information and control capabilities from these devices shown in this picture. Uh, next slide. So, in addition to implementing uh, the, our grid mod strategy, um, it was heavily interrelated with many initiatives uh, going on. And, uh, you know, just to give you a little bit of background, um, and some of you can relate to this, but, you know, in the olden days, early in my career, you know, the company uh, took part or um, uh, every few years did an integrated resource plan or IRP. And so, you know, in the past, you know, that traditionally, you know, was, was uh, an analysis to determine, okay, when do we need our next block of generation to be built? Um, but over the past 10 years, with the distributed resources being a big part of this and will be a big part of it going forward, you know, the everybody realized that, okay, you need to take that into account, um, not just your traditional uh, bulk generation. And so the commission ordered us to do a power supply improvement plan. To me, it was another uh, way to uh, label the IRP, but it had to take into account the distributed resources as part of the generation mix. So, you know, you've probably heard this before, but I view distributed resources as like a virtual power plant. It's just not centralized. And um, so that was done in the past five years, um, and we were able to issue that, and it had to be, in the latest version of that, it had to explain how we were going to get to 100%. So as you know, uh, Hawaii is, I think, the only state right now that has this 100% uh, law uh, by, that by 2045 we'll get to 100% RPS. Um, but there was a realization uh, in the PSIP that, hey, in order to incorporate this distrib distributed resources, you're going to have to make improvements to the grid. So you're going to have to reconduct your circuits. You're going to have to add more transformers to deal with voltage issues. Um, and there was going to be a cost to that. And so what spun off of the PSIP is the grid, mod grid modernization strategy. And if you look at the grid monetization strategy, what it is pushing is a, we call it the non-wire solution. So, you know, the knee-jerk reaction to um, enable more uh, distributed resource is, is to replace poles, reconductor, that sort of thing. But the grid mod strategy is proposing to use technology to provide visibility and control and so forth, such that we don't have to uh, you know, spend more money to do the traditional uh, wire solution. Um, so that's really what the grid mod strategy did. But um, in parallel, while this was going on, you know, distributed resources continue to grow. There's also a demand response uh, docket that was going on as well. So, you know, although we we're laying out the strategy and uh, the the reasons for why we need to in, uh, improve the grid and you know build up on the infrastructure. You know, there are programs that are continuing to be rolled out. Um, so I tell people internally that it almost feels like the cart's before the horse, but it is what it is. And so we have to, you know, just keep moving forward, keeping our, on, our eye on these other uh, initiatives going forward to make sure that, um, you know, we're in uh, 
lockstep with these other uh, programs. So what you see in the middle of this picture here is integrated grid planning. So this is, I'll call it the, the latest evolution of utility planning, uh, at least here in Hawaii. And really, you know, what we're moving from is from the traditional IRP process from a from long time ago to what I call end-to-end -end planning. You know, it's going to take everything into account, especially, you know, down to the distribution level of the grid, where there's now what I'll call virtual power plants scattered throughout the grid. So, you know, stuff that you didn't really have to worry about in the old days, you have to take into consideration in integrated grid planning. Um, so that's what we're moving towards. Um, that, that process is starting here in Hawaii this year. And uh, from what I understand, and Jeremy can add more to this, but um, this is one of the, I think we're one of the first utilities to try and employ this type of uh, planning process. Uh, next slide, please. And, you know, so uh, yeah, even within the company, a lot of folks were asking me, okay, how does uh, grid monetization fit into this IGB planning process I keep hearing about? So, you know, I try and use this picture to explain it, but, you know, the grid mod strategy we filed last year, um, we're, you know, we've started the implementation process and uh, we filed our first application for the grid monetization implementation in June and uh, hopefully we get approval so we start implementing it. But, you know, the IGP, Integrated Grid Planning Process, is going to start this year as well. And we're proposing it to be a, a two-year cycle. So, you know, once Integrated Grid Planning is done, uh, hopefully it gets accepted and approved by the commission, then we're gonna, obviously going to have to readjust. Any program is going to have to adjust. And, um, you know, if we need to tweak, tweak our, our strategy and implementation of grid monetization, then we will. And so we feel this as a cyclical process going forward. And there's not going to be a PSIP nor IRP anymore, nor a grid mod strategy, but it's theoretically going to roll, all roll into integrated grid planning. Our next picture. So <clears throat> one of the first things that, uh, you know, as far as our team got, when we got involved, as far as the, you know, planning out the implementation process, uh, we realized that it's it's a large program, and you know, what we felt was the best way to uh, to implement this was to break it up into phases. And as of now, we've we've uh, broken up into these three phases, and phase one, I'll call that the the AMI piece. Um, and that's what we were working on for the past eight months. But, you know, what we filed in June uh, last month was um, an application to the commission requesting approval to, to procure and deploy our advanced meters, the MDMS and the telecom network. Um, so we did file that um, and that's publicly available if you want to read it. But, um, you know, we felt that that was the first thing we needed to do. and. You know, a few years ago, you know, we had a project called Smart Grid Foundation, and it was, for the most part, to, to deploy AMI, and it would be a full deployment to all customers. Um, you know, long story short, the, the application got dismissed by the commission. We were given guidance. Much of the guidance that came out of that grid, uh, Smart Grid Foundation project was weaved into the grid mod strategy that we filed last year. So the key thing that I wanted to point out here with um, – especially this phase one, unlike most utilities, our proposed deployment uh, for the MI piece is going to be incremental. It's going to be on an opt-in basis. It's not going to be a full deployment where customers have to opt out. So it's going to be incrementally deployed based on programs that customers uh, sign up for where it requires an advanced meter. So what we've just started was now phase two. So phase two you know, largely focuses on our ADMS piece. And, um, you know, we feel that's a, a key component into giving our operations folks visibility and control of the part of the grid that they have no visibility right now. So, like most of you, you know, operators typically have visibility of the power plants and the transmission uh, part of the grid. Um, but what we're showing them is this with the ADMS, they'll have 
you know, visibility and control to the grid edge, all the way to the customer. So the meter is going to feed into it, as well as some of these field devices like uh, interrupters and line transformer sensors and so forth. That's going to give them full visibility. And, you know, you folks know that it's going to allow um, immediate notification of outages. Um, it, you know, we have an, an older OMS system right now, but it still heavily relies on customer calls, for example. So phase two is largely to to procure and implement the ADMS and further build out the deployment of these field devices that we started a few years ago. And what we envision is, you know, those devices as well as the advanced meter is going to use the telecom network to um, bring that information back. And the future phases, which at this point, it's hard for us to really scope out and it, we feel that we'll have a have a better handle once we have uh, the vendor selected for phase one and two. But um, you know, this whole ITOT convergence is something that we're trying to stay ahead of, and understanding you know what is the mode of operation that we need going forward to make sure that we, we're maintaining security, privacy, um, you know, and you know, essentially a lot of network traffic is going to be added to. The company's infrastructure uh, with the implementation of phase one and phase two. So, you know, it's, it's going to require a, uh, an expansion of our existing uh, network operations center. Um, we're going to have to see how our um, low dispatch center needs to be perhaps expanded to take in a, uh, into, into account the functionality of the ADMS and so forth. Uh, next slide. So just, just to give you folks an idea, um, I, you know, I, I keep referencing the past 10 years, and you can see how um, about nine, 10 years ago, this is when the explosion of PV started, and each year, you know, kind of set new records. And um, you know, it's uh, this, this is data as of the end of 2017, and you know, I'm I, I'm guessing we're probably close to 80,000 right now, but um, you know, we don't have a large grid, but um, you know, per capita, it's, you know, PV penetration is, I think, the highest in the nation right now. Next slide. And this is a, you know, a summary of what we stated in a power supply improvement plan as far as how we're going to get to 100% by 2045. So the power supply improvement plan was a mixture of obviously utility scaled renewable projects as well as uh, distributed resources. So, um, you know, what we're saying in the parcel improvement plan is that distributed resources will be a huge component going forward. We're expecting an expansion of additional distributed resources going forward to get to 100%. Um, just to give you an idea, here on Oahu, our, our peak load is probably something like 1,100 megawatts. And, you know, we're already at 300 um, megawatts peak of uh, uh, PV. And, uh, you know, we're pitching to have even more. Um, so as you can see, percentage-wise, it will be a, a very huge uh, component of our uh, portfolio. And that's why we need to have grid monetization in place, provide the infrastructure so that we can integrate this distributed resource. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so, you know, in, in summary, we, we did file our uh, first application on June 21st. Um, you know, like I mentioned, we've had to, um, you know, keep parallel processes or uh, programs moving. So uh, some of you have seen the Verizon commercial. It's on national uh, TV. But, you know, back in October last year, the commission ordered us to implement two new programs, uh, PV programs. One was called Customer Grid Supply Plus, and one was called Smart Export. But, you know, it's a, a way, it's new programs that required, for the first time, the use of uh, smart meters. So, obviously, we did not have grid modernization uh, implementation approved yet. So we had to find an interim solution to enable those programs, which is why you know we went with a um, with Verizon on a cellular solution to enable those programs. But because grid modernization is uh, and especially the AMI piece is going to be incrementally deployed over many years, um, what we're 
envisioning is a hybrid system. There's going to be some areas that's going to have uh, RF mesh network. Uh, there's going to be some areas that doesn't have uh, the density of programs or customers that uh, sign up for programs. So maybe it makes sense at that point to use cellular. So it's going to be a continuously monitored uh, program that has to determine a point where okay, this neighborhood now needs to be, it makes sense to economically deploy a telecom uh, RF mesh system, for example. So um, there are interim solutions that we're going to have to manage. Um, the procurement process started last year. We're hoping to wrap that up for the AMI piece that it makes up the phase one application. And we're kicking off the process to do an RFP for the ADMS piece in phase two. So we feel that thus far, especially in the application we filed last month, that we've been consistent with you know the past guidance we received from the commission as far as what they wanted to see and what we believe is the best way forward that um, will be consistent with our our uh, plans to get to 100%, but do it at a at a pace that doesn't necessarily impact the the customers. Um, uh, bills, you know, uh, much like it would for a full deployment. So um, that's our strategy and how we're implementing uh, at this point. We got a lot of work to do. Um, this is going to be a multi-year uh, program. Um, so hopefully we're, we get approval this time and, um, you know, we can start the process. I believe that's the last slide. Thank you, Rodney. Um, we're going to move right along to our, our friends from Burlington Electric. As a reminder, you can type in your questions in the uh, question pane. I forgot to mention those are actually um, saved in a file. So um, if we if we needed to, we could also publish um, an extended answer for those of you who didn't quite catch the answer um, listening to the recording. Um, I'm going to hand it off to the folks from Burlington Electric, um, Darren, Kathy, Katie, and Neil. Go 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 ahead, folks. Well, I'll get us uh, started. This is Neil Placer. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, be, I'm thankful to be joined with these uh, three folks. And the reason we have three is because we want to give you a cross-section of Burlington. Um, Darren's at the leadership level, and Kathy and Katie are both at the staffer level, one from engineering and ops and one from customer care. Um, but as, before I hand it over to them, I wanted to give you a little bit of context from, from Internext's uh, perspective. So some general information, you can see where uh, Burlington is located, um, largest muni, over 20,000 customers, uh, 16 square miles, it's a, it's a college town, um, fun place to visit. Um, but I wanted to give you some additional context. So not many people may know that they're actually the first city to run on 100% renewable energy. And they've had that claim since 2014. Um, not only that, they didn't stop there. They, had a, a, they have a 2030 vision to make Burlington a net zero energy city. And you start to see the convergence of different uh, energy sources, electric, thermal, ground transportation. Um, and then finally, I wanted to highlight, um, this really isn't just lip service. That I wanted to say it for them. They, they do have a focus on innovation and serving their customer. Um, I often tell them that they are very blessed to have that um, that innovation focus, because um, sometimes that's a struggle in the utility construct, but they really try to put that first, and I have to applaud their leadership for that. So next slide. So Aaron showed you um, this grid mod process, um, and what I really wanted to highlight here is, number one, we thought we were starting with an IT roadmap, but it really evolved into something much bigger. Um, and this shows you in red the, the, the steps we've taken. I won't go through all that, but basically, um, we're now at the RFI stage, which, by the way, for those who have interest, that will be kicking off at the beginning of August. Um, but uh, I also wanted to highlight that sometimes the, the client doesn't see all the pieces as you're going through this. So that a map like this helps, I think at this point now, BED um, knows the steps we've taken and, and why we've done them. And, and, it, and I'll let them speak to that a little bit more. But next slide. So... Bottom line, um, from a technology perspective, um, we've determined uh, BED needs to update these three primary systems, MDMS, a CIS, and an FIS. And there's, there's subcomponents associated with this, but that's, that's in a nutshell. It's, it's a big, it's gonna be a big upgrade for them. Um, but 
beyond the technology, there's also some business level decisions that need to be made. So Rodney mentioned a little bit about this IT OT conversions. You know, how do you how do you mix these grid systems with all the all the data and information needs? And and really, I'd add. Um, who owns it, right? Is it the IT department or is it someone else? And I think that's been a big conversation at, at BED. Um, also, how do you prioritize which systems you do first? Um, in their case, you know, this is a pretty massive um, overhaul. So I think most people were happy that they're gonna get what they want with, with these three systems. Um, and then finally, um, what business processes do you need, right? I mean. You can get technology, but if you don't know what you want it to do, or maybe you have an antiquated system, you don't know what you, you want it to do. So um, the point here is that there's there's technology decisions, there's business level decisions, but there's also one big, another big decision, and that's on the next slide. Um, and it really comes down to the people, and and that's 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 the perspective or the the story behind the story um, I want to tell here at BED. Um, you know, I have it written there as grid mod often involves org mod. Um, they, they really, they go hand in hand. And I think sometimes the focus on organizational modernization um, is not something that is first thought of. Um, but I have to applaud uh, BED on, on their willingness to adapt both the grid mod and org mod side of things. And, and I'll finish with this quote because I think it summarizes well. It's an odd supposition to believe that the utility grid will become more dynamic, interoperable, and integrated while the business structure and people that support it remain unchanged. Um, so BED is going to tell you their story about how they didn't remain unchanged. And so I'm going to start at the leadership level, and I'm going to hand it over to you, Darren. Okay, thanks, Neil, and uh, thank you to the Internex team for having us uh, as a part of this webinar. And uh, Neil covered it real well, um, but just to reiterate, we're a very, very accomplished utility in a number of areas here in Burlington, very proud of our success with reliability, uh, proud to have gone 10 years uh, without a rate increase, uh, while at the same time in 2014 accomplishing uh, being the first city in the nation to be 100% uh, energy source from renewable uh, generation. Um, we also uniquely in Vermont run our own energy efficiency program. So we have a, a customer facing uh, energy services team that works with all of our customers to reduce energy use. And we actually are using uh, roughly 4% less electricity today than we were in 1989 when a number of those efforts began. Um, so with all of that said, and I came on uh, with BED a little over a year and a half ago, uh, we were looking at, uh, from an IT standpoint, from a technology standpoint, uh, where are we with our systems, with some of our key systems? A uh, number of key systems were either aging or approaching end of life, end of support. Uh, and in thinking about innovation and in thinking about the uh, net zero goal that we would like to accomplish, where we can take that 100% renewable electricity and use it not only to power uh, lights and appliances and all the conventional uses, but use it to uh, help us move into transportation with electric buses and electric vehicles and even electric bikes, uh, move into the uh, heating sector with uh, cold climate heat pumps. Um, we really did not have the systems in place to advance uh, dynamic rates, to advance uh, some of the key innovations that we would need uh, to reach the net zero goal. And we launched a process uh, which we've called IT Forward. And uh, as a result of that process, there has been a consensus in the organization uh, around upgrading the systems that Neil mentioned, uh, the MDMS, the FIS, the CIS. Um, but there were some other kind of really key takeaways that I think we found uh, through that process. And um, I think maybe we can jump to the next slide and talk about those a little bit. So one of the things that we've done, uh, and I want to credit uh, Sue Fritz, our IT director, and the IT team for having a vision around this uh, from the get-go, and then knowing that we needed to involve folks across the organization, is we've taken a real kind of cross-sectional approach, breakdown silos, uh, trying to get uh, people in the room who are not only from the leadership team, but really from the frontline users of the different systems uh, across the organization and try to determine and prioritize what were the things we needed to do first. And that's where we came up with the consensus around the FIS, CIS, MDMS. Uh, we've, uh, as a leadership team, tried to support that. 
uh, and really empower folks to give us, uh, you know, the benefit of their insight and not make it a top-down process uh, whatsoever. We actually, uh, this fiscal budget and the next fiscal budget are dedicating roughly a quarter of our capital budget towards these initial system upgrades. Um, but what we found as well is, is that you cannot um, simply go through the technology upgrade process and assume that the business processes should remain the same. Um, we've really, really focused on business process improvement uh, that can go in tandem uh, with these technology upgrades. And so we've started uh, working, again, across the organization uh, to do uh, process mapping and to look at ways that we can lean out our current processes, uh, become more efficient. And as we're working, uh, as Neil mentioned, with the RFI and eventually RFP for these technology upgrades, uh, we're doing so by putting the requirements in place for the systems that we need for the future, not simply to replace the systems that we have now. And uh, we think that the model that we have here that you can see on the screen of having uh, various working teams, um, subject matter experts, uh, and leadership engagement, project uh, leadership engagement as well, uh, is not only going to be successful and to some extent has already been successful with the IT Forward project, but really could be a model uh, for how we do procurement, for how we do business process improvement across other areas, across other systems. And so uh, we've, we've had that takeaway as a part of this process. Um, and I think we can move to the next slide. And, you know, I think this is uh, the last slide for me in this. And, you know, we've really uh, emphasized some of those things that I just mentioned around, uh, you know, pushing out decision-making authority, uh, making sure that we're breaking down silos, uh, making sure that there is some consensus around some of these prioritizations. Uh, we're supporting a number of different training efforts, uh, lean management training and other business process improvement training as a part of this effort. And it really does come back to, you know, what do we want to deliver for our customers going forward? Um, we've been proud of accomplishing a number of things, as I mentioned at the outset. Uh, we know that the utility business is changing. Uh, we know that we have an opportunity uh, with the net zero effort uh, to kind of deliver different and greater value to customers in the future and, and serve them not only for their electric needs and their energy efficiency needs, but for transportation and for heating potentially as well. And we know we need a good infrastructure to do that, both a physical infrastructure and also the technology infrastructure. And we know that we need to continue to be uh, vigilant about process improvement and making sure that we are empowering our frontline staff to help us do the work that we need. So we've really seen this as uh, the beginnings of uh, hopefully a very uh, lengthy success story. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over now to Katie and Kathy. Thank you very much, Darren. Um, I'm Kathy Chamberlain. I am the Administrator of Engineering and Utility Services here at Burlington Electric. I've been here for a few years. I'm still in the learning process though. So I think my number is now 41 years here. Um, I started when I was a baby. But um, I've, I've seen a lot of changes here. I've seen um, going from manually writing down everything and putting it in a file to where we're at today, which I find very exciting. Um, the process that we're using now, as Darren has said, bringing together all of the key users within the department to see what the needs are and to really map out the processes so we could see how everything uh, fits together uh, in this grid modernization so that we can serve our customer much better and um, be able to have a better handle on what each area is doing. So we've become one big team here going through this process and I can only see it getting better as we go along. And my name is Katie Dory, and I am a member of the customer care team here at Burlington Electric. Um, I've been here for a relatively short period of time, um, comparatively. So I've been here for about two and a half years, um, and I'm relatively newer to the utility industry. Um, and I think what's been so great about this uh, full experience, as Kathy mentioned, is the opportunity to work together. Um, I think. From, from the onset when we were faced with this project, um, our team as a whole has just been really excited um, to, to work together to improve our processes and procedures. Um, we're very focused on providing exceptional service to our customers and any way that we can do that more effectively and efficiently 
um, is great. So it's been a great process. I'd like to to share what some of the benefits, primary benefits I see as um, following this process. Um, it's really interesting to see how everything has been fitting together. We've all sat down in various areas and we've done flow charts, which in my 41 years we've never done, um, to just see how everything fits together, where uh, one section goes into another section and then we meet the final at the final accounting area. It's just it's very, very interesting. And it's also been interesting to see what our key areas are for improvement. Um, getting into various details of our work has really helped us to determine the several areas that could be improved or even eliminated. And luckily my area is not one of those to be eliminated. But this has been, it's been just a, an amazing experience that I would highly recommend to anyone. Um, I think some other benefits of this process have been, you know, helping us prepare for the future as somebody who's relatively newer to, to the workforce as a whole. Um, and I really think that, you know, thinking more future oriented has been, has been great. We're really trying to design processes and procedures that will help us overall in the future. Um, it's also opened up lines of communication between departments. Um, so we can hear other perspectives within the, the, the department um, and realize that we all have the same end goal. Um, and that's to serve the, the Burlington Electric community with excellence. Um, and yeah. One thing I'd like to bring into um, just some advice that I would give to um, to give to some of the other utilities is um, be open to change. I'm specifically speaking to those people or those people, the organizations that have been in the industry for as long as I have. I know that it's not easy. Change is really tough because you just don't know what's going to happen on the other end. But here's the thing. The utility industry is changing. And the mission to serve isn't. That's our bottom line. We have to see it, but we want to serve better as we go along. So you have to ask yourself, do you want to serve my customers with less quality because I'm unable to change? This is a definitely a question worth reflecting on. Um, and I think what's been really great about this process also is that we really took the time to figure out the big picture first um, and to see how everything fits together within um, BED as a whole, not just separate business units. Um, and then we kind of aligned our, our priorities to that approach and, and focused on how that would benefit us all. Um, you know, I think coming, again, as somebody who's newer to the utility industry um, and as a millennial, I, it, you know, we often expect change to happen really quickly. So it's been great to, to sit down and really work through things together um, and take the time to to really go through each process, to go through our technical requirements. Um, and there's been a lot of really great value in hearing the historical perspective from, from folks in different areas of the department as well. Um, and I think if we go to the next slide, um, this was something that I felt really resonated um, with me and with our customer care team in particular. It's something that Aaron had brought up when um, I think the last time that he was here during his visit, but um, it kind of speaks to the different levels of perspectives that you can have with a project of this size. So, um, you know, what is everybody's level of buy-in to this? Um, is it just an IT project? Is it something that, um, you know, people hope that just the IT department has covered? Is it a grid modernization project? So um, something that you want to participate in um, to help the ED and the customers, or is it an organizational alignment project? Um, so actively wanting to in, engage to make the ED a great place to work for colleagues and customers um, to shape the future direction of the company. And I really feel like this whole process has, has been wonderful because it's been a way to incorporate all three of those levels. Um, and as somebody who's newer, again, to the agency, it's, it's great to think about the future and so hopefully see what it could be like for myself down the air when I'm in your shoes, <laughs> Kathy. <laughs> well, I'll probably still be here. Um, 
I, I just want to add to that too, that the ability to work cross-departmentally, I mean, again, I've been here for a long time and I have had the opportunity of getting to know a lot of the different employees here, but this process has allowed me to get to know what their actual job function is and how my work relates to them and how I can help make the workflow that much seamlessly. And it, it just, it's a great process. It's a great process. And um, just uh, start, we started by gaining a broad understanding of the size and scope of the project. And we've worked with Internex to narrow our focus down to define technical requirements, which is huge, um, that we really need for each of our areas to be more efficiently, uh, to more efficiently complete our daily tasks. And that's, um, it's been a huge eye opener. And I'm really looking forward to moving forward with the process. Huh? Yeah, I'm done. Okay. I'm done for <laughs> um, now. <laughs> and I think, I think that's it for us. So I guess we'll turn it back over to you, Neil. Neil and or Aaron. All right. Um, thank you to all our panelists and presenters. Um, we do have, some questions that have been um, submitted, and I'm going to start um, with the ones for HECO because I know Rodney um, has a meeting at the top of the hour. Um, I'm, going to kind of, I'm not going to quite cherry pick, but um, Rodney, there's one that relates to your traffic control analogy. Um, so for the future, are you expecting um, localized control growing into centralized control, or, or are you expecting it to be a hybrid, or what, are you, what is your perspective on that? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't really know the answer to it. I, I suspect it will be a hybrid. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I, I think I'll have a better idea once we have selected an ADMS vendor and, and have a good understanding of their capabilities. Um, and, and as an example, you know, being a ex substation guy, um, you know, I kind of question whether it makes sense to have maybe some of the control at least distributed at the substations uh you know that um feed the customers in that area um because it's just over it's just uh amazing how much data and control capability will come back to operations and i understand the adms will help to aggregate some of the the functionality and, and uh data but it's still in my opinion going to be overwhelming and you know the adms we want to be able to also layer on top um, some DERMS capability, D, uh, distributed energy resource management, because um, you know it's going to require obviously decision making based on PV penetration going on in that particular neighborhood. And you know people think Oahu is a small island, but you know we we do forecasting based on irradiance data, and it's surprising how <clears throat> you know PV production might be. Uh, different on the north shore versus on the east shore, to, uh, east shore of the island. So, I believe it's going to be a hybrid. I just don't know where that for certain. Okay, and sort of related to that, do you expect to have all those field assets using the same communications network? Or are you going to put in some sort of um, network that can be prioritized for different types of traffic? Or do you have a good um, sense of, you know, how how that might be looked at in the future? So ideally, we would like to um, utilize the same uh, network to communicate, but you know it will be a hybrid. And as I mentioned, uh, you know the telecom solution that we're going to select is not going to be fully deployed across across the islands. Um, so for a while, it's going to be a hybrid solution. So some of the field devices, or a lot of them actually, um, rely on cellular right now, and uh, we're hoping that you know in time and part of the roadmap will be to provide a, a uh, radio capability that, you know, follows the Wysong protocol, which is what we're adopting. So um, I think it's going to take time, but ideally we'd like to see it where it takes advantage of the, the network out there, assuming that it has the bandwidth capability. All right. Um, there's just kind of two more for you. One, I think you've sort of covered in your presentation. Um, it's been pretty obvious that uh, renewable penetration, in particular solar rooftop generation is a prime driver for this. Are there other key drivers that um, you, you'd like to highlight or is that um, this 100% goal and the other 
things you've already come up you've already presented on the main the main drivers yeah and yeah I think I had it on a slide, but providing customer choice is an important driver for us um enabling creative programs so I didn't cover it here, but um you know electrification of transportation there's a big push here uh, on oahu uh, in the state rather, and so you know a lot of these new programs that are coming out is going to re uh, rely on like some of some time of use rates, variable pricing, dynamic pricing and you know, I keep telling people that in able to do that, you need the infrastructure in place to enable that type of thing. So, you know, um, I, I think the the key driver is just enabling these programs. Okay, and then, um, I mean, I, I personally know the answer, but I'll let you respond. Do you, do you feel that um, advanced meters and the AMI, whatever thing we want to call, is an essential mandatory requirement for this, or is it just kind of, you know, one of the tools in the toolbox? Uh, personally, I feel it's a mandatory requirement. Um, you know, just you know, I, I didn't realize uh, how behind we are compared to other utilities. I mean, uh, I think more than half of uh, U.S. utility customers already have some sort of smart meter, or advanced meter, and uh, you know, it's amazing how far we are able to get without it up to this point. But uh, yeah, I, I believe it's a mandatory requirement, and that's why we, you know. Prioritizes that our as our first application and implementation. Okay, thank you. Now I have a couple questions that have come in for Burlington. Um, uh, the first one is uh, for any of you that want to address it. Um, how difficult has it been to keep those rates stable when the the net load growth has been the way you've described? So uh, this is Darren. I'll take a stab at that. Um, we have benefited in part uh, from participating in the renewable energy uh, certificate markets in New England, uh, which is which has helped bring in some uh, you know revenue outside of uh, sales to customers. Um, so that's been a stabilizing force, although that market has been uh, you know declining in recent years. Um, so we've had the benefit of that. Uh, we also had a reorganization effort um, back in 2015 that has yielded some savings um, and, and helped us with the rate trajectory as well. Uh, but certainly like any utility, uh, you know, we see certain cost pressures and having gone 10 years without a rate increase has been a, a tremendous accomplishment. We'll obviously uh, try to, you know, continue to hold that for as long as possible. But the key, I think, distinction for us is we want to make sure we're always investing appropriately in our infrastructure. and. Uh, that's why we're, you know, constantly monitoring rates, but also making sure we can fund projects like this. And if it ever gets to a point where we aren't able to, uh, that's a good driver to go in for a rate increase. Okay, thank you. Um, and then a, a, a second question is, um, you know, you talked a little bit about how your grid modernization turned into organizational modernization. Um, do you do you have any other um, anticipated Organizational changes that that you might do in order to implement that grid mod plan, or um, are you going to continue this collaborative model that you outlined with all the different teams and the and that feedback loop, or or maybe you're thinking about setting up a new grid mod team that's cross-functional? Do you have any thoughts on that? I'll, I'll take another stab at it. Um, I think that we're really viewing this as a as a model effort. Um, you know, having uh, the structure that was up on on one of the slides that showed um, the executive team with buy-in, uh, you know, a core project team uh, at the director level uh, managing uh, the oversight of the project, uh, working teams with subject matter experts engaged uh, on a more regular basis, uh, driving forward with the business process improvement and the uh, requirements for the technology procurement. Um, obviously, we want to see the outcome of this all the way through and see it be a success, uh, but I think we see this as a model that could work in other um, applications as well. That's awesome. Um, all right, folks, we still have um, a few minutes left. I'm going to roll forward one more slide for those of you who didn't download it. You can take a screen grab or do some typing. Um, if you heard something go by and you had a particular question for somebody, um, that you're, you're not typing in or raising your hand to ask now. Um, if we don't get any other questions, we are gonna go ahead and end at the top of the hour, but um, we do have some time left if any of you have a question or two you wanna ask.
Otherwise, I'm not going to sing a song or tell you a story. Um, I don't think anyone wants to hear that. I really appreciate your participation and attendance today, and I hope you found this panel session useful. Um, sort of a plug, we are going to be doing another one in August um, with some other projects, so stay tuned for that. Um, the, the marketing that we'll be doing for that and the you know advance notice and sign up and all of that. Um, after you sign off, you are going to be asked to fill out a survey and then um, it's short, it's just how well did you like it, you know, do you have any questions or comments, nothing too onerous, and you would also get that via the follow-up email once the webinar is over. All right, we've already lost, uh, I think, a third of the folks who had signed on. I don't see any other questions coming in. I'll give you like 30 more seconds to send us a question, otherwise I'm going to release you to the rest of your afternoon, and thank you so much to the panelists and presenters and all the attendees. And having said that, that's dropping rapidly. Um, again, the recording and the slides will be up on our website. And without seeing any more questions, um, thank you and have a good rest of your afternoon.